Hello, today I'm going to be answering the question, what is the best method for applying thermal paste? So if you're a regular viewer of the channel, you'll know my preferred method for applying thermal paste is to put a pea-sized amount of thermal paste into the center of the CPU. And up until recently, that had been working really well for me. That was until I had moved over to Intel's 12th gen Alder Lake. Um, and if you're familiar with the CPU, you'll know it's more rectangular in shape than the older generations and the Ryzen CPUs. And certainly when I was using the more square-shaped CPUs, the P-sized amount did a great job of covering the whole of the CPU surface. But moving over to 12th gen Alder Lake, I had noticed that at both the top and the bottom of the CPU, I wasn't getting a good spread of the thermal paste. So the idea for this came about. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to apply thermal paste to a 12700K using a whole variety of different methods. And I'm going to judge it on two criteria. The first is I'm going to remove the heatsink and see how well it has spread. The second is obviously thermal testing. So I'm going to do a 10 minute out of 64 stability test with each of the methods. And then I'm going to judge it on the average temperatures during the out of 64 stability test and also the maximum CPU temperature during that test. Okay, so starting off with my tried and trusted pea-sized amount of thermal paste in the center of the CPU, you'll notice that whenever I remove the heatsink, there is a large area at the top of the CPU which isn't covered in thermal paste, a smaller area at the bottom, and the other important thing to point out is that we have good right-to-left coverage with the thermal paste going all the way to the right and left side in the middle. Next up was the rice screen, and been slightly longer from top to bottom. I was optimistic this was going to give us better spread of the thermal paste. Removing the heatsink, I was surprised because the thermal paste coverage was exactly the same as the pea-sized amount. Next up was the line of thermal paste down the centre of the CPU. This time removing the heatsink, we had definitely better coverage of the CPU, particularly at the top and at the bottom, although there was some excess spill of thermal paste over to the sides of the CPU. Next application method to test was the 5-dot method, so a dot in the centre and four dots spaced around it. This one gave us very similar coverage of the CPU and a similar amount of spill off to the sides as the line in the middle. However, the thermal paste in the centre of the CPU did appear slightly thicker. Next was an X or cross of thermal paste. Removing the heatsink, we had fairly good spread of the thermal paste. Still a little bit of spillage off to the sides, but the thermal paste in the middle of the CPU was a bit more evenly distributed and not as thick as we were getting with the five dot method. Next up was spreading the thermal paste evenly over the CPU. Removing the heatsink, we had a fairly even spread of the thermal paste, fairly similar to what we actually got with the X-shaped method, but this time there was less spillage off to the sides. The final application method that I wanted to test was one that I was expecting to do pretty poorly, and that was the minimum amount of thermal paste that I could actually get out of the tube in the middle of the CPU. Removing the heatsink after the stability test, we can see that the thermal paste is really only covering the very centre of the CPU. So comparing all the methods, we can see that the pea-sized amount, the rice grain and the two little didn't provide full coverage of the CPU, while the other four methods did. Out of the other four methods, spreading the thermal paste was the only one where we didn't get significant spill of thermal paste onto the socket, making cleaning up afterwards a little bit more difficult. So with such a big variation in the spread of the thermal paste between the different methods, you're probably expecting a big difference in the temperatures. If you are, you're going to be in for a surprise. So the first and most important thing to point out about all the results here is that the maximum CPU temperatures during the IDA64 stability test were all within 3 degrees of each other, and the average CPU temperatures during the test were within 1 degree of each other. It probably won't come as any surprise to you that applying too little thermal paste to give us the worst temperatures, but what will probably come as a surprise is that the method of spreading the thermal paste over the CPU give us exactly the same temperatures as too little thermal paste. The method that actually gave us the best overall temperatures was the X shape, um, although it is important to note that the P-sized amount actually gave us the same maximum CPU temperature, and the average CPU temperature was only 0.8 degrees hotter with the P-sized amount. So looking at those results, you might conclude that the x shape method is how you should be applying your thermal paste. I'm going to say to you, I don't think it is, for two main reasons. The first is, when you come to remove the heatsink, cleaning up the thermal paste with the x shape method and a lot of the other methods where it's spilt over onto the socket is going to be an absolute nightmare. And particularly if you're new to building a PC. 
Um, there's a good chance that whenever you lift up the socket cover, you're going to have thermal paste on the underside of it. And unless you clean it off really carefully, there's a very real risk that that thermal paste is going to get into the pins on the socket. Compare that to when the thermal paste has remained just on the top of the CPU surface. It cleans off really straightforward and there's minimal risk of that thermal paste ending up anywhere on your motherboard or on the underside of the CPU. Another potential problem I noted when using either the X, the 5 dot or the line method was that the heatsink was really well adhered to the CPU because there was so much thermal paste used and actually it required quite a bit of twisting and lifting pressure to free the heatsink from the CPU. Now this shouldn't cause a problem with an Intel CPU because the CPU itself is really well secured by the socket. Um, the only side issue you might have is during all that twisting you might spill a little bit more of the thermal paste over the motherboard. If it was a Ryzen CPU you could potentially get yourself into more problems and I'm sure some of you have done this in the past if you use one of the Ryzen box cutters you have actually tried to remove the cutter and the CPU has come out of the socket stuck to the cutter. Um, this is a real nightmare to manage because you have to try and free the CPU up with the pins sticking up in the air, trying not to damage the pins and trying not to get any thermal paste onto the pins themselves. And this is one of the advantages of the P-sized amount. The contact between the heatsink and the CPU isn't as strong so it makes removing the heatsink that little bit easier. So putting everything together, in terms of CPU temperature it does not matter how you apply your thermal paste. Because between the best and the worst, we have only 0.9 degrees in terms of average CPU temperatures, which is completely insignificant. What isn't insignificant is the risk of actually getting thermal paste into your socket. The underside of the CPU are all over your motherboard. Um, and particularly if you're somebody who's new to building a PC, I would strongly recommend you stick with a P-sized amount. Applying the thermal paste in that method is really straightforward to do. It's going to be really straightforward to remove your heatsink if you want to change out your cutter. And again, the risk of you getting that thermal paste into your socket or somewhere it shouldn't be is really minimal. And in terms of temperatures, all you're sacrificing is 0.8 degrees in the average CPU temperature during a really extreme test like an IDA64 stability test. If you are somebody who wants the absolute best temperatures, there you have it. Go with the X-shape method but there is a risk that you're going to end up with thermal paste in the wrong place. So for me, I'm going to be sticking with the P-sized amount and that's what I recommend you do as well. So hopefully you have found this video useful. If you have, please remember to give it a thumbs up and if you're not currently subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button as well. Thanks for watching.